Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I am very grateful to the BDD Foundation and the OCD Action Organization for inviting me to talk on body dysmorphic disorder, cognitive behavioral model, and treatment. I uh, will try to leave some time for questions and answers at the end. I have a list of questions, and I hope to be able to answer all of them um, when we finish this presentation. So let's start with an introduction to BDD, followed by cognitive behavioral model that I'm going to propose and treatment strategies. Introduction. Okay, we have a diagnostic criteria called the DSM-5, which allows us to evaluate whether someone has BDD or not. And one of the things that we're looking at is whether an individual is obsessed with their appearance, whether they engage in certain compulsions, because currently BDD is under the um, category of OCD and related disorders. So there's obsessions, there's compulsions, and sometimes avoidance of various different situations. And we have a specifier, uh, which has been added to our evaluation, which is, does the individual have good insight, poor insight, or absence of insight? And what does that really mean? It really means, do you really believe in what you're saying? If you're thinking your forehead is big or your nose is too long, are these thoughts um, really convincing to you? Do you think they're reasonable? Do you think other people will think that? or not. Another specifier is with muscle dysmorphia. And this, the, these individuals are concerned with their body build. Uh, they usually feel that they're too small or insufficiently muscular. And they engage in particular behaviors in order to uh, look more masculine or more muscular, uh, bigger build. And um, so they're a category onto themselves. And often they have other concerns or feelings of having flaws in other parts of their body. There is a form of BDD that is often not spoken about and that's the olfactory reference syndrome. And this is um, a group of individuals who are preoccupied, obsessed with their body odor. And they believe that other people view them negatively because of this particular odor. They tend to smell themselves. They take several showers a day in order to remove the odor. They change their clothing over and over again. They seek reassurance from others. Uh, they may avoid certain foods because they feel that it's going to create more of a body odor. Um, I've had patients, for example, put soap around their genital areas because they feel that they're emitting uh, an odor and that the soap is going to give them some positive fragrance. Um, they may be brushing their teeth to minimize bad breath. Um, constantly washing their clothes, uh, changing it several times a day, etc. BDD affects about 3% of the population and it's worldwide. It's not culture specific. If we look all around the world, um, more or less, we have the same number of uh, percentage of people who are affected by BDD. It usually starts around the ages around 12 and 13. We're seeing more and more younger children, however, get preoccupied as young as four, five, six years of age talking about their bodies and not feeling happy, uh, finding fault with a particular part. And this is, seems to be more and more prevalent in younger and younger children. Interestingly, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, um, all the, which is unusual because in most disorders, we see a more propensity in females than in males, but in BDD, we see a one-to-one -one ratio, which is very um, challenging and interesting. This is a group of individuals who are 
very, very depressed, very upset, because unlike OCD, where you could avoid certain things, you can't avoid your body, you can't avoid yourself. So you're always carrying yourself. And as a consequence, they have a lot of suicidality, about 89% engage in constant suicidal thoughts, about 29% actually attempt suicide at some point or another, and some do commit suicide. So this is not a disorder that one should trivialize. Uh, these are not narcissistic individuals. They are not vain. On the contrary, they are feeling inadequate, um, inferior compared to others and compared to their ideal self-image. In all medical practices, we see BDD. In cosmetic surgery uh, clinics, we see about seven, five to seven percent of the population. And unlike individuals who don't have BDD, who tend to be very satisfied after the cosmetic surgery, BDD individuals tend to get worse. This is why we try to discourage anyone from going for cosmetic surgery. Um, usually, they, what they want, they can't get. They'll go for further surgery. They'll get angry at the surgeon for not being able to reproduce exactly what they had in their own mind. In dermatology clinics, um, about 12% of the population have BDD. And again, uh, most individuals with BDD initially attempt uh, to go to a dermatologist because the face is a major concern, having smooth skin, the coloration, um, pimples, and therefore, before they're seen in our offices, uh, they've usually gone to dermatologists for approximately 10 years. Uh, we see in rhinoplasty clinics, we see it in dental clinics, we see it all over. So I think that physicians and uh, others who are practicing in these particular other uh, specialties should be aware and assess for BDD by asking individuals if they're concerned about their appearance. Do they mirror check? Um, does their appearance ever lead them to avoid doing something, going somewhere? Do they feel bad about themselves? If we look at the common areas of concern, generally it's the facial features. Their skin, as we said in dermatology clinics, um, having smooth skin, having a certain coloration, um, having a totally perfect, um, with no pimples, no imperfections, no scarring, um, so the skin is extremely important, wrinkles, um, the size and shape of the particular parts of the face, the nose, the forehead being too big, not having um, a hairline that's perfect. So asymmetry, my eye, one eye is bigger than, than the other, uh, my eyebrows are not perfect. Um, so the face is the most important area, but that doesn't mean that they're not concerned with other areas such as their genitals being too small or labia being too big and wanting surgery in those areas. Uh, augmentation of their breasts um, or buttocks or their abdomen, even their hands and feet, uh, too big, too small, too wide. It doesn't matter. It, it could be any particular part of the body, shoulders, their back, height. Um, there are only two particular, in the United States at least, we have two surgeons who do surgery to increase your height. And it's really meant for people who are um, extremely short and have, uh, have had problems with growth. Um, and it's a very dangerous surgery. Uh, you can end up being you know, unable to walk for the rest of your life. And yet there are individuals with BDD who seek surgery for this and muscle dysphoria that I mentioned earlier. 
there's a lot of associated compulsive behaviors or avoidance of behaviors. Um, so a person may avoid going out at night. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, going out during the day because they don't really want to be seen. They prefer going out at night when their particular defect is not as apparent. Uh, they may want to sit in the back of the room, not in front of the room. So again, to avoid taking notice of their defect. Um, they may want to go to dimly lit restaurants or places where it's not too crowded if they are actually going out. A lot of reassurance seeking. Uh, do I look okay? Is my nose too big? Comparing oneself with others, uh, sitting in a room and or waiting room or school or work uh, and wondering whether that person looks better than you. Uh, comparing the particular part of the body with one's own particular part or overall um, appearance. Going to tanning salons to look healthier. Uh, camouflaging by wearing excessive makeup or uh, using a lot of uh, beauty products. Uh, positioning oneself so that one profile is perceived as being better than the other. So sitting in a way where you're going to attract attention to what you perceive as a better uh, position. Skin picking. Well, skin picking could occur for two reasons. One, because you're trying to get rid of impurities, just more um, skin picking for the sake of that satisfaction of purification. Or skin picking that's related to BDD, where you're thinking that you, if you could only correct your skin, if you can only have smooth skin. And so you're trying to take out the impurities. And of course, you could scar yourself as a consequence of that. Um, and so it's important to kind of differentiate whether skin picking is occurring related to BDD or unrelated to BDD. Mirror checking is the most dominant compulsive behavior that we see in BDD. Uh, so that's one of the first questions we ask. Do you do a lot of mirror checking? Often they're looking in the mirror and eventually they might start avoiding mirrors because it becomes extremely frustrating that nothing changes. They're looking for some anatomical change that just will not and does not occur. Uh, excessive grooming is another factor of um, whether it's changing one's clothes to look thinner uh, or to have uh, more muscular looking uh, legs or arms. Uh, using, again, various beauty products to have uh, your hair look a particular way. And it's interesting because the particular body part may not be, uh, they, they may have certain flaws or like we all do in uh, on our face, on our bodies that we may be dissatisfied with. But it's interesting that what other people may have perceived in them as their particular concern is not necessarily the concern of the individual with BDD. Um, I remember a woman who had this big mole on her face, which was obvious to everyone, beautiful woman, um, but she had a mole. So if you asked me, what was she going to come into your office and complain about, it would have been the mole. But in um, from her perspective, it was her hair. And yet she had this beautiful, curly, magnificent hair, and she just felt unattractive, ugly because of this hair. Here are some of the emotions um, that we have in, in BDD. Shame, guilt, self-disgust, embarrassment, uh, regret, a lot of anger and depression. But shame and self-disgust, shame about oneself, uh, the way one looks, uh, feeling really disgusted with one's appearance. Embarrassed to go out and be seen the way one is. So here we just went through some of the behaviors, some of the preoccupations, the body areas that are of concern, and uh, also the emotions that we see. And now I'm going to propose a cognitive behavioral model that I put forth a, a while back. And treatment is kind of um, related or based on this particular model. 
One, like everything else, we have a biological predisposition to developing a particular disorder. Um, and that's true for any disorder. So usually there's a, some kind of disposition. Uh, it may or may not come out. Uh, it depends on the experiences of life uh, and the situations we find ourselves in. The next is operant conditioning, which I will explain, social learning, uh, leading to classical conditioning, all of which I will explain uh, what this really means. But my idea is not only to explain how an individual with BDD thinks uh, and how those thoughts are maintained, but also how do we develop BDD? Where does it come from? Um, why does one individual have BDD and someone else not? So there are genetic factors here um, that we don't really have a lot of uh, evidence for genetic factors, but we do know that 8% of the uh, individuals who have BDD have family members who also have some psychiatric disorder. Um, there's also visual processing problems where the individual is very focused on details rather than global looking. So they selectively attend to details in other individuals and in themselves. And Jamie Fusner and ourselves, we've done a lot of uh, work looking at visual processing. Jamie Fusner has done incredibly good work looking at fMRIs and evaluating how these individuals see themselves, see a neutral object, see the world around them. And he speaks specifically about this detailed orientation rather than global uh, compared to the general population or other individuals. Uh, somatosensory problems, these are not only do we see things, but we also feel things. So I may feel that my face is puffy. I may feel that I have a pimple. I may look at myself and not see the pimple, but I feel that it's there. So I may feel for it because there's just an internal sensation of having that or puffiness. So there's also somatosensory uh, problems. Faulty neuroanatomical circuitry, big words, and what does that mean? Basically, we're talking about that the visual areas of our brain and our emotional areas are somehow not connecting properly. Um, very similar to OCD, uh, and we're not going to get into it, but uh, because that's not what our discussion is about today, but uh, definitely there are areas of the brain that are affected. So let's look at what operant conditioning means. So let's look at operant conditioning. Well, that was one of the things we said after having this biological predisposition. Um, this is where the individual starts developing BDD. So we have a child who is being positively reinforced um, consistently or intermittently for their appearance. So either uh, neighbors, parents, schools, uh, they're commenting on the child's appearance or particular body part, their height, how cute they are, how poised they are, um, their particular body shape. So what does this mean? So Johnny is uh, playing the violin on stage and parent, he finishes, he comes off, and instead of saying, wow, you played that piece wonderfully, that's amazing, amazing job you did, they say, gee, you know, you were the tallest kid there, and you looked so handsome, you were just great, and yes, you played the, that piece wonderfully. Um, so there's, again, the emphasis either on height or how cute uh, the girl who's, you know, um, in ballet classes or whatever, or playing soccer on the field, and rather than commenting on the performance or on how well they kicked the ball or got a goal, um, the, appear the 
comments is based on, gee, you looked fantastic. You were just adorable. Um, you're so poised. Um, you know, you just have the right body build uh, just to make that ball go in the right direction. Um, you're just really, you know, perfect in your muscular build. Your legs are so strong. So there's a lot of comments and and we all do this actually but in some families we see it a lot more than others and it may be either direct or it may actually be indirect by commenting on um, they're watching a movie as a family and mom or dad says my god that person's teeth are so white they look so beautiful I wonder how they got that you know I noticed a um, lot of actors and actresses have perfect teeth. I wonder how they do that or um, about how poised or some comment about their appearance. Social learning refers to either vicarious learning, we call it, or modeling. Fancy terms again. Basically, it says we look at others and we learn not only by having certain experiences ourselves, but we learn from looking and observing other people's experiences. So I have a sibling and my sibling is getting a lot of dates. So I assume that because he is handsome or she is pretty, uh, they're getting a lot of dates. Um, they are muscular and therefore they're asked to play all the time. Um, so I'm learning whether it's through the media that, you know, if you look a particular way, you're going to get rewarded in various different areas of your life. As a consequence, I start developing certain beliefs about the importance of attractiveness, the importance of being muscular, the importance of being tall, uh, of being poised, um, of having beautiful complexion. Um, a lot of judgments around one's appearance. And then I start developing values around attractiveness. So I have certain beliefs about attractiveness that I've learned through observation or through direct experience. And then I develop certain values based on this. Now, classical conditioning or evaluative conditioning, as you saw in the slide. So we have this development first of being rewarded for our appearance or seeing other people through media or around us, friends, classmates, being rewarded for their appearance. And then we have what's called classical conditioning. And to understand how classical conditioning is um, applicable to BDD uh, and how we learn further, um, let's take the most uh, common uh, classical conditioning paradigm that uh, people usually talks about. It's the Pavlovian, the dog. I remember, I don't know, for those of you who've taken psychology courses, um, you have food, right? Anyone, the dog salivates when they see food. Uh, and then you ring a bell and you give the food. Each time you ring the bell, you give food and the Food obviously leads to salivation. Eventually, you could take the food away and just ring the bell and you'll get salivation from the dog. So what you're doing is you're pairing the food with the ringing of the bell. So that ringing of the bell alone will lead to the same behavior as food usually would lead to. So uh, automatically, food leads to salivation, but generally ringing of a bell doesn't make anyone salivate. But if we pair the two together, then we can get the ringing of the bell to give us the same behavior. If we look at another uh, example, let's say uh, you're bullied, right? And the people that are bullying you are tall athletic guys uh, or girls in school that are bulliers. And so what happens? Naturally, you feel fear, you feel anxious, and you feel angry because you're being bullied by these people. So this association that you may make in your head between um, being bullied 
and tallness, athletic people in general, eventually you may not be bullied, but when you see tall athletic people, you might start feeling fearful, anxious, and angry, even though the bullying stopped years ago. So this association that was paired initially will continue to give you the same emotions as if the bullying was continuing. So let's look at how um, this applies to BDD. So for example, in abuse, we know that individuals with BDD are abused more than OCD and more than the general population. Dr. Kim Lani and I did some work about this a while back <clears throat> where we found that um, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse was more dominant in BDD individuals. Uh, and teasing as well, other individuals have, other researchers have looked at teasing and have found that BDD individuals tend to recall being teased more so than the general population. Recently, we published an article on bullying, and what we found is that individuals with BDD, again, compared to OCD and general uh, population of kids, these were uh, kids from, I believe, 7 to 10 or 7 to 12, um, were more bullied uh, and had more of a reaction than uh, other uh, children. So what do we know? Abuse, teasing, bullying, acne that occurs at that age, puberty, generally leads one to feel disgusted or anxious or sh ashamed of oneself or sad, depressed. Now, if we take these um, naturally, uh, naturally occurring things like abuse, bullying, teasing that lead to disgust, anxiety, and maybe at that time pair it with a particular body part. Arbitrarily in your mind, you, if you were teased, for example, about having thin legs, or you were teased about curly hair or frizzy hair, or you were teased about your nose. Um, so that body part or abused, or during bullying, something was said, uh, or you think you were bullied because you're not uh, muscular or because you don't, uh, you're not athletic or uh, you think your, uh, your bones are too puny. You may associate those particular body parts with these particular emotions and then the body part alone just leads to the emotion, even though you're no longer bullied, you're no longer teased and you're no longer being abused. And this leads to certain beliefs and values, again, uh, because of these connections. Let's look at operant conditioning. So when we are feeling these negative emotions of anxiety, shame, depression, fear, what do we do? Well, we try to take that, obviously, those feelings away. And one of the things we do is by um, camouflage. And so I put a lot of makeup on um, to conceal and so that I appear to have smooth skin. I may keep going like this on my nose, pushing it up so that my nose is more lifted. I may uh, use a lot of makeup or I may go and straighten my hair or I may go to a tanning salon to get a certain coloration. And what does that do? It takes away at least temporarily those negative feelings. And because temporarily those negative feelings are taken away, I feel relieved and I continue to engage in those behaviors uh, because it makes me feel better. So what are our treatment uh, strategies based on this particular model that we just spoke about? Well, one is behavioral, which is exposure and response prevention. Others, cognitive therapy and pharmacological treatments. For the purpose of uh, today's um, talk, we're going to keep only to exposure and response prevention and cognitive therapy. What do we not want to do for treatment? We don't want to do cosmetic surgery because usually that 
worsen symptoms. And we don't want to engage in psychoanalysis or talk therapy because that makes us more obsessional and doesn't really target what we want to do, which is to change the way you think about yourself. So um, usually individuals with BDD don't want to come into treatment because obviously clinicians can't change their appearance. Uh, but what we can change is what we call a mental representation. And that is no individual knows how the person looks, right? None of us really know how we look, except when we look in the mirror and we have this idea of the way we look. And this idea of the way we look is based on visual perception, taking in visual information, and then how we feel in general, uh, our mood, and then how we think, our values and our belief system. So an individual with BDD thinks they're gonna feel better if they can change their physical appearance. So that's theory A. Theory B is us clinicians feel, okay, if we can change this mental representation, you're gonna feel better. So basically we ask individuals with BDD to give us time a um, couple of months, at least to begin to see if we can alter the way you have this perception in your mind of the way you look. So there's body image. It's the way we picture this mental representation of how we believe about ourselves and how we think we look. Then there's appearance, which is the actual physical appearance, which is what the BDD individual wants to change. And while your appearance may not change, your body image can change. So rather than risking the factor that changing appearance may make you worse, we'd rather see if we can change your body image. So what we do is one is exposure and response prevention. We try to take away all the compulsions that you're using in a gradual way um, in a way that you're able to tolerate. We pace it properly so that you could expose yourself, your particular flawed area, what flawed in your mind, um, and see that the various different reactions that you anticipate, such as people laughing, talking about you, not uh, giving you the proper service, um, not hiring you, um, overall rejection, laughter, teasing about your appearance will not really occur. So that would be the only way that you would be able to um, kind of start thinking about it differently. And your anxiety over time will diminish. And so will your disgust reaction to yourself. Here's a case example of a 17-year-old female who lives with her parents, and she feels she has baby cheeks, um, doesn't like the texture and shape of her eyebrows, and wants to have more athletic-looking arms. She used to do a lot of YouTube posting, but she hasn't for a long time because of the way she feels about her appearance. She hasn't left her home in some time, and she feels that others will judge her. So we develop a hierarchy. We look at, um, you know, what are the things that she cannot do currently and how much anxiety would she feel if she did do it? So here's an example. Uh, she says it on a zero to 100 scale. Her anxiety would be about 30 if she went uh, looking for the mail. She lives in an apartment and the doorman sees her. If the doorman doesn't see her, her anxiety would be less. Uh, if she does Zoom with friends or FaceTime, her anxiety would be 40. If she went into the gym and someone else comes in, it would be a 90. But if she went into the gym and there was no one else, uh, she would anticipate someone coming in, so she would have anxiety, but not as much as if someone was there. Uh, actually, going out of the apartment, going into Starbucks, seeing a friend would be extremely anxiety-provoking to her. So we would gradually expose her to those particular situations. Uh, we probably would have done a lot of cognitive therapy prior to exposing her to those particular situations. And cognitive therapy is looking at 
um, what are the thoughts um, that are not helpful or that are really um, stifling the person? What are uh, destructive thoughts about one's appearance or situations? And we try to challenge those thoughts. So let's look at some of those thoughts, like all or nothing. Because I look like this, I will always be ugly. So you challenge that thought. I know that person over there is thinking about my big forehead. Well, is there anything else that, that they may be thinking? Is there any other alternative explanation for why they're looking at you? Um, I know I won't have fun out with my friends. Nobody will give me the time of day because of my nose. Well, did you feel this way when you hadn't uh, developed BDD? Um, do you, have you actually gone out and tested this theory? Uh, where's the evidence that people who have big noses are disliked, rejected, no one talks to them? Um, can we go out and find some people with big noses and see uh, if they're really getting, you know, someone talking to them? Are they getting the same service at Starbucks or at the uh, grocery store? Uh, it doesn't matter that I do well in school or that my family and friends love me. I'm still ugly. So discounting your positive traits and, again, selectively attending to the negative things. Challenging these thoughts and then doing some experiments to test out these thoughts uh, over and over again. So cognitive therapy is a very important component of um, the treatment of BDD and generally precedes doing a lot of the exposure and response prevention. So it kind of prepares the individual to do the exposures that we just spoke about. Why do people mirror check? We talked about mirror checking. Um, we know that the anatomy doesn't change, but they're hoping that they will look different. They, are, um, they want to know exactly how they look. They're comparing it to their ideal self and what they used to look. Um, and it's just kind of magical thinking that somehow five minutes ago um, and to now something magical is going to happen. And what happens if we feel good about ourselves periodically, we may look in the mirror and we do feel better about ourselves, right? So, or the lighting may be different or the mirror may be different. So we do feel better. So it becomes kind of reinforcing, rewarding to look at the mirror periodically, which then makes us want to keep going to the mirror. But what we want to teach people is to use the mirror um, what, how the average person would use it, which is maybe to blow dry your hair or to shave or to um, put on makeup, not for the purpose of just checking your appearance. So we also do uh, retraining. What we want is the individual to look at oneself globally and not to use any judgmental words to um, view oneself in the totality rather than focusing uh, on a particular flawed area. So you describe yourself like I have brown hair up to my shoulder, my eyebrows are about one inch apart, um, my nose is two and a half inches, um, I have an oval face, um, uh, my shoulders are um, I don't know, about a foot and a half apart. Uh, there's a space of about four or five inches between my uh, chin and my shoulders all the way down to um, your body parts, to your feet. Here are some uh, indicators if people are not engaging in treatment, they're canceling sessions, they're not doing homework in between sessions, uh, they're telling you they don't want to do this, um, they're criticizing the treatment, they're changing topics, um, you know, they're not talking, they're refusing to come in, they're making up excuses. So we have to stop and re-engage the person periodically when we see treatment resistance. More than most disorders in BDD, there's constant engagement and treatment, engagement and treatment until the person is fully engaged in treatment. So one has to be very aware of treatment resistance. 
Another thing that we should be aware is family accommodation. Often family members say, well, what do I do? Um, you know, do I give in? Do I, um, you know, allow the person not to invite people. I have another son or daughter who wants to invite their friends and he's telling me, you, you know, I don't want anybody in the house. I don't want you inviting your friends. Um, do I accommodate that? Do I allow for the surgery? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, you have to be compassionate. You have to be understanding. Uh, you have to validate the feelings of the person. At the same time, we cannot allow uh, a, total accommodation of what they want because they're not going to go forward in treatment. So no, you have to invite friends over. You have to encourage, cajole the person to at least come and say hello. Um, maybe find a way to get them to engage, to go out. Uh, so provide opportunities and not to accommodate. But at the same time, we don't want anger. We don't want negativity. We want understanding of how the person feels and validation for their feelings and their suffering. And finally, um, there may be at times where they lapse and the symptoms come back even after treatment. So all we do is do some booster sessions. We go back and we re-challenge some of the thoughts. They're just flare-ups, might be due to stress and anxiety in other areas of their life. And relapse prevention, um, we have found in a couple of studies, is very, very helpful at the end of the treatment or a month after treatment. Um, but be aware that treatment is long and one needs to have patience with the treatment, both the patient and the family members and the clinician. Thank you again. Uh, I'm going to now take some questions or answer some questions that have come in. Um, I'll repeat the question and try to answer those questions. So um, we're now in the part where we have some questions that have come in and I have Madison over here. Yeah. She's gonna see um, what questions have come in and I'll do my best to see if I can answer them. So Madison, what do we got? How do I bring my loved one in for treatment if they are resistant? Very good question. How do I bring my loved one in if they are treat if they're resistant to treatment? And most often BDD individuals again want cosmetic surgery, they want to go to dermatologists, they do not want to go and see a, a clinician, a practitioner. So you bring them in by telling them that they're suffering that they're not able to get out of life what they want. They're anxious, they're depressed, um, they're not functioning, they're either not going to school or work, they're not dating, they're not getting out of life the things that they want. So it's not for their appearance that you're bringing them to treatment, you're bringing them in because you want them to feel better about their life. And Based on that, most often BDD individuals will come in because they will agree with you that they're not happy with their life. Should I pay for cosmetic surgery? I guess this is a parent asking or a spouse asking whether they should pay for cosmetic surgery and the answer is no. Uh, obviously everyone has a right to do cosmetic surgery if that's what they want. Um, but we know from research that often cosmetic surgery leads to feeling worse about yourself. And so we want to discourage cosmetic surgery. So what we would want to say is, let's try some other methods before we engage in a discussion about cosmetic surgery. If you want cosmetic surgery, that's up to you, but I cannot actually give you money to do that. It would be like giving a drug addict money to go buy drugs. Um, you don't want to give them the money to do it. Unfortunately, uh, they may resort to other methods of getting it, which you have to be aware. Uh, but if you've gotten them enough into treatment, hopefully the clinician, the expert will be able to convince them uh, to give them some time so that they do not engage in treat, uh, in cosmetic surgery, at least for three, four months, and to give treatment time to work. I'm afraid that my loved one will commit suicide. I feel like I'm a prisoner of their needs. What do I do? 
It's very, very hard because as we saw in one of the slides, th this is a highly suicidal population. Um, they do attempt suicide. They often think of suicide and there's nothing more scary to a family member to hear that someone you love is thinking uh, about suicide. However, having said that, at the same time, we don't want the suicidal threat to be used to get what they want. Meaning, I don't want you to invite people to the house. I don't want um, to go to school. I don't want to uh, go to work. I'm going to live in this house for the rest of my life. Um, not that they want that, but they feel they can't really go out and do things. So. We want to encourage with understanding, compassion, uh, with love that we want them to get help. Um, so it's a fine balance. Be careful, watch someone who is talking about suicide. Um, definitely tell them that, you know, if they're thinking about it, we have to go to the hospital. Uh, that often stops them. Um, from talking about suicide unless they're really serious about suicide. Um, but often suicide is, is a threat or a way of saying, I'm really suffering and I need you to do this for me, for me not to suffer anymore. But unfortunately, what they want you to do will lead to further suffering long term. So we have to uh, really try to get them help if they're truly suicidal. And every clinician who's seeing a BDD individual at every session must assess for suicidality. I've been in therapy for a long time now for BDD and I don't feel any different. What should I do? Is there anything else I can try? Uh, well, again, we don't know what therapy individuals have been in. <clears throat> Talk therapy doesn't work. Psychoanalysis doesn't work. We know and have manuals. We have two very good manuals out there, one by Catherine Phillips and Sabine Wilhelm, and one by David Veal and myself on treatment uh, of uh, BDD. It's a uh, guidelines on how to do treatment for BDD. Uh, Dr. Kimlani and I have a new book coming out by Hogrifi this year, uh, which again will go step by step on uh, treatment and how to do treatment. Um, so there are evidence-based treatment manuals out there that will tell you what is proper treatment. And unless you get proper treatment, as is in the case of every disorder, you're not going to get better. So um, you need to have a proper diagnosis and a proper treatment um, in order to do well. There are medications that we have not spoken. I think somebody else will be talking about medications that can be utilized. Um, we are every day working on new treatment modalities and testing them out. So I think that um, there are other um, evidence-based treatments out there. So that's what you need to make sure that you're getting and not something that's ineffective. I know that others can't necessarily see what I see, but it doesn't matter because I still see it. What do I do about that? Right, right. Um, well, as I said before, we want to change this mental representation that you have in your mind. When you're looking at something, you get an idea of how you, how you look because visually you're having some kind of input. Um, and then I think all of us know that if we are feeling good one day, we're walking, talking, energetic, we're standing up differently, we um, come across differently, we feel better about our appearance because our mood is different. So if we can change our mood, if we can change our values and not put so much emphasis on um, attractiveness. We didn't go into it today, but if we did a pie chart, for example, and looked at all your values, uh, family, friends, education, career, attractiveness, how much time are you spending on your values? And can we spend more time on other values besides attractiveness? Can we um, actually see whether the, the amount of time spent and the value you're claiming to have matches. So 
you need time to be able to change your feelings, your beliefs and values, as well as what you're actually seeing. Oh, I got it. Okay, I think um, we've answered most of the questions uh, that have come in and I thank again all of you for coming and I thank the BDD Foundation and the OCD Action of UK for inviting me um, and uh, wish you all well. Bye. Thank you, Madison. Oh, thank you. <laughs>